Take your Bibles, turn to Nehemiah chapter number 2, please. Don't let the time bother you. It's 1220. Just said that so you'd know I know what time it is. Amen. I cannot preach too long because we've got a group going to the assisted living home service. And they have to be there. So don't, uh, don't get any false hope in that. But um, just want to... Trying to offer you hope now because some of you got nervous because I just asked you to open your Bible. Uh, I want to preach this morning. I want to uh, kind of lay the foundation where we'll be back at tonight. And uh, something that's been on my heart, I trust will be a help to you. Nehemiah chapter number two, if you'll stand with me. I believe for the sake of time, we're going to go to verse number 17. Just read verse 17 through 20 and uh, lay the foundation, perhaps give you the first thought as we look at uh, this passage of Scripture. I've been reading the book of Nehemiah uh, for some time now, just going through its chapters, going through the verses, and uh, the Lord has spoken to my heart, and He's helped me tremendously. I love the book of Nehemiah. I love the, uh, what is happening in the book of Nehemiah. And I love the pictures that we can draw from it. Verse number 17, Nehemiah chapter 2, the Bible says, Then said I unto them, Ye see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that would be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us arise up and build so they strengthened their hands for this good work. But when Sanballat, the Hornite, and Tobiah, the servant, the Ammonite, and Geshem, the Arabian, heard it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, What is this thing that you do? Will you rebel against the king? Then answered I them and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will arise and build, but ye have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. Heavenly Father, I pray your blessings upon the reading of your word. I ask you to order my lips now, speak everything they ought to speak, and nothing they shouldn't. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to get help from your word. Lord, you know the need that we have as a church. You know the need that we have as families. You know the need that we have individually. I pray, Lord, that you'd meet those needs today through your word. Help us, encourage us, strengthen us in the things of God. If there's someone under the sound of my voice today that does not know you as their Savior, I pray, Lord, that today, through the testimonies, through the songs, through the preaching, that the sweet Holy Ghost of God would draw them to salvation. They'd be saved by your marvelous grace. We'll bless you and thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Uh, I want to mention some things today. And if I had to title the message, it'd simply be this, Principles for Building. Now, these principles, and that's one of the things about principles, you can apply them to any aspect of building that you desire to apply them to. If you were building a physical, um, a physical building, then you could apply these principles to that. If you're building a family, certainly you can apply these principles. If you're building a church, you can apply these principles. If you're a Sunday school teacher and you desire to build a Sunday school class, then these principles are for you. They are principles. They are uh, laws. They are things that are laid down that work in every circumstance and situation when it comes to the subject at hand. So I want to preach on principles for building from the book of Nehemiah here. And uh, with the Lord's help, we'll mention three things that these people had, the children of Israel had, that allowed the walls to be built. I'm encouraged by this passage of Scripture because of how the Lord used this and how the Lord uh, brought the people of God together for a common goal and a common purpose, and that was to glorify God. You mark it down, you say, well, they wanted to build Jerusalem. Yeah, but Jerusalem was the place where God got glory. You study your Bible, you'll find that Jerusalem has always been a place where God gets glory. And if you study your Bible, you will find out that Jerusalem is a place in the future where God will again get glory. I, I believe He still gets glory to some extent from Jerusalem. So how's that? 
Well, I remember back in March and those that were with us will remember this when we uh, were driving up that highway and we were ascending that mountain and we got right to the top and we, we finally broke over the top where you could view Jerusalem. You, you, words would not express the amount of praise and the adoration that was in the hearts of God's people inside that bus when we first saw Jerusalem for the very first time. Many of us saw that city that has meant so much through Scripture and God got glory that day. So he's still getting glory through Jerusalem, but he will in the future gain a great deal of glory from that place called Jerusalem. So as we look at this passage of Scripture, I want you, I want you to remember and to take note of some things that help these people be able to build the walls back and to be able to undertake the great work that God had called them to do. You understand this work was ordained of God. I like being a part of God's work. I like being a part of what God wants done and what God is desired to be done. I enjoy being a part of God's work. And this work was brought about by the hand and the heart of God. And that's the one thing we need to keep in mind as we go through this. Let me mention three things to you and then we'll elaborate on them. I believe what accomplished this great feat and what God used for these people to be able to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem were three things. Number one, they had an emotional investment in the work. Secondly, they had a physical investment in the work. And thirdly, they had a mental investment in the work. I believe those three things are what God used to accomplish this great building project that we have in the book of Nehemiah. Today, as we begin, I just want to deal with the first of those. I want to deal for a moment with the emotional investment that these people had in the building of the walls in Jerusalem. The word emotional, according to the Webster's Dictionary, it means a disturbance, an excitement, or a strong feeling. It is a conscious mental reaction directed toward a specific object. They, these people were stirred emotionally. They were very emotional. Don't be afraid of emotions. You see, the problem is the charismatic movement is so emotional that a lot of Bible-believing Christians and Baptists have decided not to be emotional at all. Well, if I am correct in believing this, I believe that God created us as emotional beings. He gave us the ability to be emotional. He gave us the ability to be angry. That's why I said be angry and sin not. He gave us the ability to be happy. He gave us the ability to, to be sorrowful because guess what? There are times when we must and when life necessitates us being sorrowful. That's why in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, he said, uh, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not as, uh, as those that have no hope. He said, it's all right to sorrow. You're going to sorrow. There are sorrowful times, but just don't sorrow like a lost man. He said, sorrow as someone who does have hope. So there's going to be times you need sorrow. There are going to be times you need to shed tears. Can you imagine what your life would be without the ability to shed tears? Without the emotional outburst that you can, I mean, sometimes crying is kind of like the pop-off valve you would absolutely explode if it were not God allowing you the emotion of sorrow or the emotion of the emotional outpouring of tears and weeping and things of that nature. So they had an emotional investment in what was going on. Notice in verse number 17, they, and I want to take the, the, the definition that I just gave you, were three things that the, that the Webster said about being emotional. He said it is a disturbance, it is an excitement, and it is a strong feeling. I want to take those three things and show you that they had an emotional investment. Number one, they were disturbed. The Bible said in verse number 17, Then said I unto ye, ye see the distress that we are in. I believe they were disturbed by their current situation. 
These people, as Nehemiah has lo looked at the walls and he's viewed the destruction of Jerusalem, Nehemiah said, hey, ye see the distress that we are in. You see the current circumstances and situations. And I believe not only was Nehemiah troubled and he was disturbed by it, but they were also disturbed by their current situation. I believe they understood it was a personal situation. Notice the wording in, in your Bible. We need to study the Bible. We need to read the Bible as it is. The Bible said, you see the distress that we are in. Nehemiah had the burden that began all this. It was Nehemiah's burdened heart that went before the king. And the king looked at Nehemiah and said, hey, why are you sad? You've not been sad before when you come into my presence. He said, how in the world could I be happy when my city lieth in waste, when my people are in captivity? How can I have, how, have joy when this is going on? So we see the, they were disturbed. They, they took, it wasn't just Nehemiah's burden. It wasn't just Nehemiah that was upset. They had a personal situation on their hands. They said, this is the distress that we are in. Can I tell you, dear church, we are a church as a whole, but a church is made up of individuals. And if the church is ever going to get help, if your family's ever going to get help, you are going to have to understand your personal responsibility in the situation and the circumstance. I believe every father should take it his personal responsibility to see to it that his family is in the proper place and the proper spiritual condition. But I also believe that every mother should take Take it as her personal responsibility to make sure that her family knows God and her family is right in the sight of God. I believe every child in a family should take it as their personal responsibility to seek God and to have his touch on their life. You see, they did not blame Nehemiah. They didn't blame Ezra. They didn't blame Nebuchadnezzar. They didn't blame Babylon. They didn't blame anybody. They said, hey, this is the distress that we are in. Can I tell you how it would be written in modern English? If you, if you were to rewrite it in modern terms, it would read something like this. Well, then said I unto them, you see the distress that the oppressors have brought you in. Thus putting the emphasis on the oppressor, not on themselves. If it was written in modern terms, it would be, you see the distress that the world has got you in. The blame would be then put on the world. It would read, you see the distress that the pastor has got you in, thus putting the blame on the pastor. You would say, you see the distress that your husband has put you in, thus putting the blame on the husband. But it did not read that way. It said, you see the distress we are in, no matter the blame, no matter who's at fault, no matter why we're here, we are not satisfied with our personal situation. We have a personal situation. I believe they were disturbed by the place of their situation. Notice the Bible said there in verse number 17, how Jerusalem lieth in waste. The Bible said, let us build up the wall of Jerusalem. In verse number 20, he said that you will have no portion, no right, no memorial in Jerusalem. They are disturbed because it's not just their personal situation, but the place that they are viewing. This is beloved Jerusalem. This is the place that God has so used in the history of the children of Israel. And we'll say more about that in just a moment. But they didn't. They, weren't, they, were, they were disturbed by the place of their situation. I believe they were disturbed stirred by their perceived situation. Notice what the Bible said in verse 17, the last phrase there, that we be no more a reproach. They had realized their current situation made them a reproach and gave God a bad name. Now we know it was the sin of the children of Israel that led them into captivity. Because they did that which was right in their own eyes, because they, uh, they went after their own way, because they followed after other gods, because they did not serve God and were not faithful to God, He allowed captivity to come in and lead them away. And now they are slaves in the land of Babylon, a portion of them has come back under Ezra. Now another portion is being sent under Nehemiah to build the walls, but they understand they are in a situation that, that, that disturbs them. They are broken hearted with the circumstances that they are in. Would to God, would to God, we had an entire congregation disturbed with our current circumstances. Amen. 
I wonder what a difference it would make in our prayer life before we come to church if we were truly disturbed with our current circumstances. You say, preacher, did you not see the service this morning? Did you not hear the great testimonies? Did you not uh, hear the great singing that the choir did? Do you not see what God is doing? I do see, but I wonder what would happen this morning if we had such a burden under our current circumstances. And situ- I wonder what would happen in America if every child of God got up today and they were truly disturbed by our current situation. You say, well, I don't like it. I, I understand you don't like it. But how much have you prayed about it? There's a whole, there's a big difference between what you don't like and what you're willing to pray about. I don't like a lot of things that are going on, but Brother Ken, how much time did I spend calling on the name of the Lord in the midst of this? I am not happy with the perceived situation. That is that we are in reproach. We are bringing a bad name to God. I wonder what a difference it would be if we were disturbed by our current situation. So we see they're disturbed. The second definition was to be excited. They were not only disturbed about their current situation, they were excited about the coming solution. Notice what he said in verse number 18. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, has also the king's words that he had spoken unto me. And they said, let us rise up and build. Man, they got excited about the solution. They got excited about the fact that, hey, something's about to take place. Things are about to change. The walls have been destroyed. The gates have been burned. But the hand of God is upon us to build the walls again. And that excited the people of God. They got excited about the coming solution. Two things here I I want to bring your attention to that I think we must note. They were excited by the hand that inspired the work. Read verse number 18 again. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me. They were excited because it was God that brought, about, brought this about. They were excited because it was the hand of God that had brought them back to Jerusalem. It was the hand of God that was beginning to build the walls. It was the hand of God that was going to hang the gates on the hinges. Hey, he was going to use man's hand. There was going to be a physical investment a little later on. But right now, they are excited over the fact that God has raised up a generation to rebuild the walls. Can I tell you, I am excited today of the coming solution. I'm excited about what God has in store for us. You say, preacher, do you not know the days we're living in? Do you not know the hardship that is coming to America? Do you not know the judgment that is falling? I do know all of that. But every time I read in the word of God of judgment that has come, there's a remnant of people that have received the blessing of God. There's a remnant of people that have had the touch of God. There's a remnant of people that have had the power of God upon their lives. And I am not satisfied with the current situation but I am excited, thank God, about the coming solution. And the solution is the power and the hand and the glory of God upon His people that are faithful and want to serve God this day. They were excited about the hand that inspired the work. They even got excited about the hands that would install the work. Verse number 18 again. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. They got excited not only that God was going to do the work, they got excited about the fact He's going to use them to do it. How many times you get excited about the fact God's going to use you to do something? Hey man, I heard a pastor get up one time and you've heard me say it before. The good news is there's a thousand dollars that God wants to send to some missionary. The bad news is it's still in your wallet. Y'all have heard similar statements and things like that. When was the last time you said, oh, hallelujah. I mean, I've got an opportunity to do something. Hey, it was the hand of God that has inspired this work, but He has privileged me to be able to take part in that work and to be involved in that work. They got excited about the fact they were going to get to be a part of it. They were going to get to physically rebuild the walls and that excited them. So they were disturbed by their current situation. They were excited about the coming solution. But can I say this? They had a strong feeling about the construction site. Now that's the definition of emotional. Disturbed, excited, and a strong feeling. I want you to notice the strong feeling they had for this construction site. It was Jerusalem. This was home. Is there not just something about the word home? You see, I've got, a, I've got a home. And there's something about being home. Lately, Brother Ken, home has become more precious to me 
because of the fact I've not been there a lot. Because of the events that took place, I was, I, I was away from home for some time. And, and Brother Ken, there was just, there's something about coming home. Jeb, the other day, Jeb and Ashland, after they finally got home, been gone for three weeks, just come in and kind of spent the night one, maybe once or twice. But then they walked into the door and I heard Jeb say, oh, I'm home. You realize this is what Jerusalem meant to these people. This construction site where this was going to take place, this was home. This was that place that God had given the children of Israel. Notice some things about Jerusalem. It's called the city of God in Psalms 46, verse number 4. The Bible said, There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her. And that right early. The Bible calls Jerusalem the city of the Lord. In Isaiah 60, verse number 14, the sons also of them that afflicted thee shall come bending unto thee, and all they that despise thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet, and they shall call thee the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel, city of Judah. It's called the city of the great king. In Psalms 48, verse number 2, beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is in Mount Zion to the sides of the north, the city of the great king. In Isaiah 1, 26, the Bible calls, calls Jerusalem the city of righteousness. Righteousness. And I will restore thy judges as at the first and thy counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, thou shalt be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion shall be remembered with judgment and her converts with righteousness. In Zechariah 8, 3, it's called the city of truth. Isaiah 62, 12, a city not forsaken. Isaiah 1, 21 and 26, a faithful city. Nehemiah 11, 1, Isaiah 48, 2 and Matthew 4, 5, a holy city. In Jeremiah chapter 3, verse Verse number 17, it's called the throne of the Lord. Isaiah chapter number 60, verse number 14, Zion, the Holy One of Israel. The Bible tells us in Psalms 135, verse number 21, Blessed be the Lord out of Zion, which dwelleth at Jerusalem. Praise ye the Lord. Can I say this about Jerusalem? It was the place where God was. That was the place where God was. As they looked over the city and they saw the walls destroyed and they saw the gates burn with fire, they realized, hey, there's something about this place. It's not only home, but this is the place where God dwells. This is the place where God has met with us. This is the place where we worship Him. This is the place where we adore Him. It was the place where God dwelt. Now can I ask you, I know that the Lord, when He saved us, He dwells in us now. We're indwelled with the Holy Ghost of God. But can I ask you where it is that we go and expect to meet with the Lord? It's His house. In this picture, this place is our Jerusalem. It's the place where God is. Brother Ken, I hope it never changes to be the place where God is. Brother Eric said this morning, when he pulled up, he sensed that the power of God, the Spirit of the Lord was there. Why? Because God dwells here. I know that God does not dwell within the walls of the building, but you understand when His people come together, you have indwelled believers who come together. And the Bible said where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty, and the Lord meets with His people, and He comes together to be with us as we worship Him. What a wonderful place this place is. I'm trying to stir up your emotional investment in this place. I don't know how you felt when you came to church this morning. But I do know how I felt. And I know how I felt when I pulled up on the prom property. And I know how I felt when I walked in the door. I felt emotional. I know how I felt this week as I prayed. I was disturbed by a current situation. Amen. Say, so why, preacher? We've not seen near as many saved as I'd like to see saved. We've not had as much liberty as I'd like to have. We've not seen God do as much as I'd like to see Him do. So, Brother Ken, I was just disturbed by the current situation. But Brother Troy, I was excited over the coming solution if the Lord would just show up. And didn't He show up this morning? Didn't He help us this morning in the Sunday school hour in the, in the worship service? Has He not helped us? You see, that's the coming So That's the only solution we've got is meeting with the Lord. And I'll be honest with you. I'm... I'm very, I have very strong feelings 
about this construction site. I don't know how many churches I'm in in a year. I really don't know. It's not all that many. I'd say probably I'm in more churches than the majority of the people here. But Brother Troy, there's only one place I feel about like I feel about here. There's only one place. So why is that? I have an emotional investment in this place. Is that not the way it is, church? I hope you feel that way. This is church. This is our place of worship. It's the place where God is. Psalm 76, 2, In Salem, also in his tabernacle, is his tabernacle, and his dwelling place in Zion. It was where God was. I'm talking about the construction site. Where's God want to build walls? He wants to build them right here. But we're going to have to have strong feelings about the construction site. I mean, we're going to have to have real strong feelings about this place we call Harvest. It was a place of worship. In Psalms 122, verse number 3, Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together. Whither the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, unto the testimony of Israel to give thanks unto the name of the Lord. Jerusalem was the place they went to worship. You read the book of Psalms, you read those Psalms of Ascent, and uh, the, the history tells us that they would sing those Psalms as they ascended up to Jerusalem. And then once they got there to Jerusalem on the, on the, on the, the, the temple steps there, they would take a step up and they would sing one of the songs of Ascent. And then they would take another step up and they would sing a Psalm of Ascent. And then they'd take another step up. Say, so what are they doing? They're preparing their heart to worship the Lord their God. Why? Because they were in Jerusalem. And that was the place place of worship. I hope you didn't come to see nobody but the Lord today. Amen. Now I'm glad I got to see all of y'all. Y'all are wonderful. I love y'all. Y'all are beautiful people. I mean beautiful people. I'd rather see y'all than I had see anybody in the world. But I came with greater expectations than seeing you today. Amen. We got to sing that song, Brother Richard, I Am Redeemed. And we hit that chorus. He said, I am redeemed. When he got to that part, I am redeemed. It, it, it just, it, it seemed to me that God just opened up a little crevice there. And through there, I saw him. And, and it seemed to get wider as the Lord displayed himself. And I got to see him. And that's what I came to church for this morning. It's a place of worship. It was a place of joy. I like this. Psalms 48, verse number 1. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of His holiness, beautiful for situation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion. The joy of the whole earth, the Bible said. That's what Jerusalem was. On the sides of the north, the city of the great king, God is known in her palaces for refuge. Can I say this about our church? It is the place where we meet with God. It is the place where we come to worship. I know, and you've heard me say it, I believe you must learn to worship privately if you are ever going to truly worship publicly. I believe that. But God has ordained the local church as a place for His people to come together and worship corporately together. Brother Troy, that's what this place is. I have a very strong feeling toward the place where God wants to build. I have a very emotional investment in this place. This is our church. It's our place of worship. It's a place we meet with God. It's a place of joy. And I trust today that you have a strong emotional investment. Because that is the number one principle for building. You will never build a church life until you are emotionally invested in church life. Amen. Amen. A lot of people, they build an emotional sports life. You know why? Because they get disturbed by their current situation in sports. They get excited about the prospect of what can be done in sports and they have strong feelings of the field. And I understand that. I've been there. They build a real strong sports life. There are people build a real strong family life. You know why? Because they're disturbed by the current situation. Maybe it's they don't get to spend enough time with their family. Maybe it's uh, they, they uh, don't, whatever it is, but they're disturbed. Then they're excited over the prospect of building a family 
And then they have a strong feeling about that family that God wants to build. So they build a very strong family life. And that's a blessing. But I wonder why so many don't have a strong church life. Could it be because we're missing the first principle in building? And that is to be emotionally invested. Emotionally invested in the church. We were talking about it Wednesday night. I'll offer this to you again. I mentioned it a couple weeks ago, maybe just briefly. We are the children of God. Is that right? Children of God. We worship God. We belong because we've been purchased by Christ. We belong to God. Is that right? We believe that it is right to worship God and serve Him alone. Is that right? Is there any other place, any other place than this place that is called the house of God? Now, I know there are other churches around and they're called the house. I'm talking about the church. Is it not called the house of God? It is where the people of God come together and proclaim the word of God and we worship God. Is that right? So therefore, if we are to serve God above all else, and this is the only place we call the house of God, then should it not take precedence over the other things in our life? I'm going to say something, and I'm going to walk out on a limb, and some of you are going to cut the limb off, and I'm going to fall, and so be it. I firmly believe that the house of God should take priority over your own family. Now, hold on. Hold on. Don't cut me off there. Let me explain. Because if it does, then you will raise your family in the house of God. But when your family takes precedence over the house of God, then the church must accommodate to the family not the family to the church. And I believe many times we raise a generation, they believe what the preacher says when they're in this building. They believe the standards and convictions that are preached when they're in this building. But it does not go home. It does not go home. And we raise children who grow up to believe what the preacher says is for church alone. What he brings out of God's Word is for church alone. And when we get home, there's an entirely different set of rules. Mom and Daddy, I would like to thank y'all publicly for making home just like church. They did. We did not have an attire that we wore to church and another attire that we wore at home. We wore the same thing. Now, I know we didn't, you know, we had clothes that had paint on them for when we was working. Y'all understand what I'm saying. But there was not a different set of rules. We didn't talk one way at church, talk another way at home. The music we listened to at church was the music we listened to at home. The songs we sang at church were the songs we sang at home. The Bible we read at church was the Bible we read at home. And I firmly believe, Brother Troy, one of the reasons we are losing so many young people is because church never makes it home. And the theory is this in young people's eyes. It never got home. So it's not meant to be my life. It's just my church life. And the two never intermingle. So therefore they grow bittered, impatient, and even resentful to the things of God. Amen? Amen. Now that I've got you sufficiently quiet, how is your emotional investment in this place? How's your emotional investment? Does your heart still get stirred when you know on Sunday morning or Wednesday night Hey, I get to go to my church. 
I get to go down there and I get to park in that parking lot. I get to walk in those doors. I get to see those familiar faces. I get to see the pulpit. I get to sit and sing the songs of Zion. I get to hear the word of God preached. How is your emotional investment in this place? Because if God's ever going to build anything, He's going to build it through people who are emotionally invested in His work. That's how He built the walls in Nehemiah's day. Tonight, we're going to deal with the physical investment because that follows the emotional and the mental investment that must be present if God's going to build. Let's stand to our feet today. Every head bowed and every eye closed.